The first of all, apologies to delay. I was being interviewed by Nature, and they were running a bit uh, late, so consequently I'm running a bit late. About the NWA, in fact. So, Alright, um, so in this director's update, I'm going to talk about things that happened since the last project meeting. Uh, so, one of the good things that's happened is that we put in a proposal to AL for a multi year um, funding uh, agreement through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure uh, in Australia, which funds the Australian operational component of the MWA. Um, and we had previously been funded at a level of $1.32 million per annum in Australia. Um, we have had that be increased to $1.4195 Australian dollars per annum going forward, and we have a two-year uh, funding agreement from AAL. Um, so this is the first time that we've had that. Previously, the NWA has had to have yearly contracts with AL, which is quite inefficient, to be honest. Um, the actual request that I put into AL was for a three-year uh, funding contract, and a third year is subject to uh, prioritisation of the NWA in the Australian midterm review of the decadal plan, which I'll come back to later. So, this additional funding is the result of an increase in scope of services provided by the NWA as a as a facility, so we have now agreed to include the operation of the ASLO, so the Australian um, also virtual service known as the MWA, as part of the official um, MWA provision of service, and this extra funding of $170,000 a year will cover an additional FDA um, to the MWA operations team for that purpose. Um, in addition, one of the things that we've done with the MWA operation staff had their contract extended two years because that would have been bad. They were expired this month. Um, and all the other national contributions to phase two have either been paid or are in the process of being paid or negotiated. But I'm confident that all that will be resolved very shortly. So that's good. That's the, that's the funding good news. We've been funding for two years and we can continue at the level that we're currently at. So this is the new org chart that will come into place once we hire the, the ASO person. Do we have a um, Pointer. Uh, so if you're, if you're familiar with the, the old chart previously, all this has done is add one extra box there on the end of the right, for the one FTE for the ASO. Um, those of you who are less familiar with this, this is how the MWA management and operations team, thank you Adam, is currently structured. So director, then underneath that as curtain we have Mia Walker, Dave Emmerich, Andy McFarland is here, Greg Sleep, and Andrew Williams. You can see that they're all on point five, uh, point 0.8 FTE. Um, the other point two of their FTE is provided by Curtin for uh, operations in Tyra, which is in Chief Radio Astronomy. The ASO position is part of the full FTE. And then this is the MWA management group here. Uh, so these are reporting lines, whereas these are management, uh, line management lines. So this is just adding a box here. Now, if you add up all the FTEs there, you get to 6.3. So the MWA is a very lean operation in terms of what we provide. All right, this is the bad news. Uh, funding for phase two uh, goes for the next two years. Beyond that time, we will need new funds to be injected. So this sets a timeline for the instance of the phase three of the MWA, which will need new partners and uh, probably a new funding model and potentially a renegotiation of what uh, the core investment in the NWA looks like. Um, even in phase two, I didn't put up the list of partners, but I assume people are familiar with that. Uh, New Zealand's membership currently expires at the end of this year as does Japan. Our colleagues in Japan are uh, working on a solution to extend their membership for the rest of phase two. Um, my last understanding from New Zealand was that so people in New Zealand are looking for that there's been no standard progress. George, is that your understanding? Yeah. Um, the current funding regime that we have is actually very tight. There's little available for sparing or other major contingencies. is a problem. Um, and so one of the things that I want to highlight here is we are reliant on curtains to provide a large amount of in-kind services beyond those which are required by the collaboration agreement. So um, Curtin have agreed to do this, but I just want to sort of draw this everybody's attention that we are um, very much in debt to certain for this. So this is beyond what they need to do. So for example, all of our funding uh, for media, we don't have any of that anymore. And so pamphlets to hand out to people about the NWA, certain pays all those to be reprinted. 
Things like that. Alright. Um, I'll just put this slide here. I don't really want to talk very much about this because Adam is going to talk about science, I assume. Uh, but one of the things I was asked recently in a talk about what the NWA is good for is what are the scientific issues of the NWA. And so I just want to remind people that we have a wide field of view with a few source sensitivity and spectral coverage. And um, I'll just put some lines there. I don't, I don't really want to go into this, just to say that these are things that I think that we can use to um, our advantage, even with the coming of upgrades to low power and so forth. So, as you all know, with the main inspector coverage, which allows us to do things that other instruments can't do, so it's worked for some time a few years ago. You know. So you can really, with the MWA, these red points start to fit into these in a way that you couldn't before, by sort of using the surveys. Um, and this is a slightly confusing plot, but basically it shows that MWA has the best of these sorts of sensitivity of, of any current telescope at uh, these frequencies. Even in phase two, which is not as good as phase one. Alright. Output. So, in the five years of operation of phase one, we produced 110 refereed scientific publications. Now, when I say we, this is the total of those which are official collaboration papers and any papers using the MWA for engineering purposes and others. And since 2017, I think there's been another 50 odd produced with another, I think, 20 in progress at the moment. So it's around 150 to date, over 5,500 citations. I didn't update this, this is like from a few months ago, but it must be close to 6,000 now. But yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and a growing rate of about 1,500 citations per year. This is, this, is, this is the same plot as I had six months ago, I haven't updated it, but it will. So this is just showing you that. Um, the lead author of the paper basically follows the number of people in the collaboration. So this list is historical. So we've got um, India here at 9%, whereas now if I read it, this just would drop and China would come up. So that just, and also I should say, most of these papers are being generated by early career researchers. So I think last time I checked, it was 82% of the papers were led by either postdocs or PhD students involved in the collaboration. So they really sort of powerhouse of putting out um, the work from the MWA. Now, all of that, if you consider the number of publications produced as a function of dollars spent on operations, bearing in mind how lean an operation it is, the MWA is the most cost-effective telescope on Earth, or radio telescope anyway. I like this. It's a good metric, right? <laughs> good metric. It's just something good to say. So, in fact, another thing that happened recently is I got to work with some economists on uh, modelling the economic value of the MWA to Australia. So this is a piece of work that was paid for by Pawsey. The Pawsey Centre Computing Centre used the MWA as a case study. And so um, this is the output from that. So this shows you the impact relative to no MWA on Australian only, so it doesn't consider any other countries, but Australian only GDP versus <laughs> Uh, so, and also increasing human capital. So, we're here. So, according to the economic modelling, the MWA currently produces about $350,000 uh, in GDP for Australia and about $300,000 worth of human capital. So, that's about $750,000 for, at the time, $1.32 million invested by the government through AL. Um, scientific projects, I'm told, are considered to be a success if uh, an economic return is 50% of what the government spends. So this is considered a success. Now this of course does not include what Curtin puts in, so it's not the full um, Australian uh, contribution to the MWA. 750 on top of just spending 1.3? Yes. Right, so it's in addition to... It's in addition to, the actual yes, to the actual spend. So this is what's returned beyond what the activity itself uses to be self-contained. Yeah. So this is um, modelling that tells you what goes into the community in Geraldton, the number of PhD students produced in MWA, um, there's, there's a dollar value for the number of papers, the paper is worth $72,000 apparently to Australia, <laughs> in terms of the flow on effect, not the actual thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was good fun talking to economists. <laughs> weird thing. Um, anyway, so there you go. So this, this report exists. If people want to access it, I'm allowed to uh, distribute it to a limited set of people. I sent it to the board, but if you're interested, let me know. 
so that's good. It's actually, actually, I quite like this because if this is true, like if 50% of government spending is um, what's considered a good return on investment, then as this goes up, you should be able to ask for more money. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not that's actually likely to happen, I don't know, but in theory, in theory, you can do that. All right. All right, so those of you who were the last meeting know that our correlator is ancient. It's been in the field since January 2012. This is well beyond its operational lifetime, and so I think the work has been happening uh, to design a new correlator, which is more flexible and scalable. This is a uh, design activity led by uh, people at Curtin, the engineering group, along with input from NWA. So this is Brian Cross, Ian Morrison, Greg Sleep, and others. And that design has now been finalised and it's being um, validated by uh, experts elsewhere in Australia. And the board approved at our last board meeting, in the face to face board meeting in December. So this will be the number one upgrade priority, so this is the previous upgrade priority. So um, the place in the correlator for our explanation will be the first thing. Um, now, if we get new receivers, then we start to move towards the position of this case. So this correlator will allow us to do that, but on its own, it won't. Um, so this is a path to a path, if you like. So we're currently seeking funding for this. Just to highlight some advantages, if we do get it in with the current system, um, we will have proper fringe tracking and real-time voltage beams, more flexible frequency and time resolution options, so you can even go down to sort of sub-kilohertz mode. Uh, the ability to do a whole bunch of different uh, time and or frequency averaging, um, which will reduce the data rate out of the correlator, and you can possibly do pseudo real-time calibration. Obviously, this has to expand to specific piles of food, and uh, the capacity to increase the independent bandwidth as well as a whole bunch of useful things, um, which others are going to talk about, I think, in the future, uh, later in the meeting. Um, all right. Moving on to the schedule, you will have seen an email from me recently uh, about the DDT request that I put out for time from 1 July through to the reconfiguration on the 18th of August. There was an extraordinarily strong response, stronger than I was expecting. Um, and it also resulted in a number of discussions around the need to access um, LST ranges in the long baseline configuration in the second half of this year. Um, so I just want to say to anyone who talked to me about this, and there were a number of people, yes, this has been noted, and uh, I will put a proposal to the board on Friday around what the schedule for next year will look like. Um, 2019B was undersubscribed by about 15% uh, for the normal correlated mode and just slightly undersubscribed for the VPS. So that takes some of the time available. Um, one of the other things that I want to highlight is operation over summer. It's increasingly risky to operate the array in high temperatures in the day over summer um, with the aging equipment that we have and the lack of sparing. So we may initiate shutdown periods uh, in, in the summer period coming up to mitigate this risk. But again, that's a discussion to be had with the board. To let you know. All right. Therefore. So this is a slide that's put together fully by Greg. So this is just showing what the, um, the data flow on the MRO, or from the MRO is for you looks like at the moment. Uh, so you've got your tiles, your receivers, your polyphase sort of bank and mulch capture, the correlator, and an online archive all on site. This is slightly different to ASCAP, for those of you who familiar with ASCAP, ASCAP doesn't have this piece here. Data are then uh, transmitted down uh, to some front end servers. Is working on. We've got three at the moment. Then into the long term archive causing, which says here 30 petabytes, but actually we now have 40 petabytes in place as the uh, most recent agreement with, with Pausey. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say about the new correlator. The new correlator is up to data rate by a factor of eight. So this number here of how much we have in the long term archive starts to become somewhat important. So if we put a new correlator in by you know, early next year, then uh, we hit our limit of 40 petabytes within 18 months. So this will be uh, the subject also of discussion that we need to have with the board about how long is it that we keep data in the archives. Um, you know, we can't store stuff indefinitely at an ingest rate that's 8 petabytes a month. So actually yeah, up to 8 petabytes a month. Then it goes out to the ASVO, which as you can now see is part of the MWA, and then out to you guys, the rest of the world. So, that is very similar to what FKO will look like. 
So as I said, the ASO is now formally, Operation ASO is now formally incorporated into the services provided by the SWA. This requires a new service level agreement with Corsi, the terms to which we agreed um, on Friday last week, and I'm expecting that to be um, signed off shortly thereafter. This is a summary of um, what we've had now in terms of the ASO jobs completed, the data that it's served out, the registered users and um, their breakdown. So we've now had 55,000 jobs since the uh, ASO started about 18 months ago. We've served out a lot of data, 1,500 terabytes of data. There are now 312 users, which is a big jump in the number of registered users for the ASO. So the last time I showed this slide, um, which would have been in March, it was only 202. And the split between MWA users and the public has changed enormously. So we've got 142 MWA users, 170 public users. Um, if you look at the active users, though, it's still primarily 50% MWA users versus uh, the public. And the difference is, especially now that we're serving calibrated disabilities, large numbers of people who are not in the MWA collaboration are accessing the archival data. So we should expect to see this flow through to non-collaboration papers. So I think we're in a regime where it doesn't actually make sense to only track collaboration output. I think we need to really seriously start to track any MWA output. I was actually, when Greg sent me this yesterday, I was really surprised at how much of a jump this has been in such a short time due to serving as calibrated visibility. So I have been going around the world pointing this out to people and good to see that people are actually doing it. So, yeah, roughly 40% of active users at present are non-collaboration members. So it'll be interesting to see if this increases any further and if the total numbers go up. Um, I'm also going to ask Greg for some breakdowns of who these people are and where they come from and what are they doing and are they in countries that might want to join the MWA, for example, and get the data when it's not public. Well, you never know. So this is the, um, the volume of the archive over all time. And uh, so you can see we're up to 32 petabytes now of our total of 40. And this is the start of, of phase two, so you see this huge jump. So we're ingesting now about 1.1 petabytes of data a month. As I said, the new correlator when we get it, jump up to as high as a factor of eight times that. Uh, this is the last six months. And so um, you can see this is in terabytes here. And so we're, we're putting in about you know, 900 terabytes, 600 petabytes at a uh, certain month. So, and well, that's journey for halfway through. So you can see it's a fairly rapid increase, which, as I said, will lead to a sort of policy on how long data are kept in the archive. In fact, all the FRB shadowing data, which takes up quite a lot of space, uh, we are actively deleting at the moment. So, five petabytes of data is being deleted. Um, we need this deletion process to be automatic rather than manual. So at the moment, Greg's doing it all manually, and even though we're hiring someone to run the ASO, I don't want to spend all the time deleting data manually. So it has to come with a policy setting that just allows it to track through um, the system. All right, so that's the data in. This is the data out. So this is the ASO data downloaded in terabytes per month um, since the ASO started in December 2017. And so you can see there's this rapid uh, jump up and there's now sort of a slow increase there, but yeah, it's about um, 1,500 terabytes of data a month going out. Well, this cumulative, so that's what we've had out so far. Alright, this is uh, archive volume by project. Now, I apologise for these graphs because whatever Greg was created, it's automatic script that generates them, and so the colours don't stay the same for project <laughs> in the pie chart. So, um, Anyway, so you can see the shadowing, the park FRB shadowing is a, is a fairly big chunk here. It's one of the reasons that we're uh, still losing that. Then the next largest is, uh, is Gleam, um, then FRB, more FRBs on the WA on the soil observations. I mean, there's sort of a reasonable split here between the sort of four primary science films of, of the NWA. And then I'm not quite sure what other counts because I think CDT time probably should be more than that. I'm not sure how they've done that, but anyway. So this is telescope time for a project. Again, this is over all time. So here, though, we see the EOR team has the 20% of the whole time available for a water pipe. The pack process, then the shadowing, 
Single and solar, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then this is just what's happening over the last six months. So again, the shadowing is just taking up a lot of the data space. Nothing very uh, dramatic there. Oh yeah, this is the project, so again, shadowing. But we can delete that, so that's nice. Alright. I want to point out that MWA is a test bed for the SKA. Um, this is extremely important to the future of the MWA, particularly in Australia. So um, I think Andy will talk about things that's happening on site. You're going to mention the SKA stuff? I wasn't, but okay. Okay. Well, just to say that um, the MWA has MOUs with the uh, LFAA consortium uh, in order to use the infrastructure on the MRO that the MWA has to test um, and support the iterations of the Aperture Array verification system for AVS and the Engineering Development Array. And these are possibly the station, SKA station um, architecture uh, projects, which look at uh, risk mitigation for the SKA in terms of understanding which antennas to use. So if we didn't have the MWA, we would not be able to do these SKA projects. And this is extremely important um, as an argument for SKA in Australia. So just to show you a picture, so this is, um, these are old pictures, this is the EDA-1, but they're just deployed EDA-2, and this is AADS-1, but they're just deploying AADS-2, with a scale for it, okay. But you can see these are MWA dipoles, in the SKA station, on our site, fire <coughs> site, but on the MWA part of it, using MWA infrastructure. Alright, the other thing that we're using MWA to test it for regarding SKA is, I should say, regional. Centers. Um, so the architecture that I showed you of data flow for the MWA is similar to what we'll have for SKA, and so MWA is a system, if you like, in something called the Australian SKA Regional Centre Project, the OZ SRC. Um, so that's been funded by the Australian Government at CSIRO, which is $4 million. MWA will get $432,000 to have one of the software engineers for that project embedded in the OZ team for eight years, so for eight years, three years. Um, three years to work on scalable solutions for SKA processing, with a particular focus on EOR processing. So how will we best process the EOR data um, for the SKA is the question, um, but they want to do something practical for people now. So contract discussions are underway. I hope that concludes soon. Alright. I also want to mention the MWA in the Australian Midterm Review. Um, so the anchor funding that we have goes to 30 June 2021. And as I said at the start, I actually applied to freeze the funding. An extra year is contingent on um, the MWA featuring positively in the midterm review of the Australian Astronomy Decadal Plan. This is going to be formally launched uh, in a couple of weeks at the ASA, Australian Astronomical Society, meeting um, in Australia. Mr. Stavely Smith is the chair of the National Institute of Astronomy that runs this process. Um, I've spoken to Lister about offering the services of the MWA management team to assist in the review, but it would be good if other members of the collaboration in Australia are also involved, so if you're interested, please contact me. Um, the reliance, as I said, on SKA for MWA work is going to be key here, but not just as a technical proving ground, but according to Lister, they want to see uh, the use of the MWA as a training facility for the next generation radio astronomers and users of SKA, and that doesn't necessarily have to just be for Australia. Um, and so I'm aware that there are other processes that are similar to this ongoing in partner countries and we're happy to provide similar inputs to these processes beyond Australia. So again, if you need this sort of thing, let me know. It's useful. So, my summary. Well, Excellent. So we've got funding for two years of operations, which will seem to be in a phase two. Um, this has come at a small increase uh, to our funding and also a small increase to the operational scope. Uh, the Corelli design is completed and funding is being sought. Changes to schedule will be discussed with the board on Friday. Um, the archive and the ASCO continue to be a great success. I'm actually astonished by how successful it is. And the provision of the calibrated visibility has been a huge increase in the number of non collaboration users of the MWA, which is good. Um, MWA is vital for SKLO, as I said, not just in terms of design and prototyping, but as a sort of a full end to end SK model. And so, uh, it provides mixed risk mitigation processes for SK, which is important for our future funding, which is contingent on our performance, at least in Australia, in the uh, new term review. So input from the community here is critical. So happy to participate in 
not a fan of that film since first. Oh, I think you've been very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I'm looking at multiple alternative solutions for all these for large scale data processes. So I think that's really well. Yeah, but actually, to others who have a source of thought, maybe we should get together and, you know. Just to be systematic, I have to go and talk to the sporty about this stuff, so. Okay, well, I'll go over to the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we move on to try to find the same way again.